Welcome to our second town hall video on having a culture of health and safety during this time of COVID. I'm Bruce Kelly, chair of the Borrego Springs COVID-19 Task Force, which is financially supported by the Borrego Valley Endowment Fund. After a few introductory comments, I will introduce our moderators, Caroline Minildi and Betsy Kanak. Uh, Betsy will introduce our panelists, Colonel Gary Johnson, Dr. Chuck Matthews, who are sitting together sharing a room, and Dr. Sherry Gandy. Uh, after our panelists speak for a few minutes each, Caroline will uh, ask them some prepared questions, and I will ask questions you can submit today. Uh, in this webinar format, uh, only the voices and videos of the panelists and moderators will appear, but you attendees can submit questions by clicking on Q&A on the Zoom menu bar. So if you aren't seeing that right now, scroll up and down and it should appear uh, probably across the bottom. Then we will select questions uh, relevant to the topic of this town hall. Uh, we're planning town halls and other topics so you can ask other questions then. So don't feel you have to get in all your questions today. Uh, experts tell us that, you know, even if an effective vaccine and a safe vaccine is approved by the end of this year, the majority of us are unlikely to receive vaccinations until at least mid 2021. And we've already been experiencing, as you know, six months of limitations on our activities. And many of us are becoming fatigued, even worse, uh, we're stressed and anxious about the effects of this pandemic on you know, critical decisions we have to make uh, about our lives, our own lives, our family members' lives. Uh, so our task force thought it was a good time to ask the leaders and experts on our panel to help us become more resilient to get through these remaining months. Uh, they will share ideas about how, as a community, we can help residents be more resilient, as well as how as individuals, we can learn additional coping skills. So now I'm going to introduce our moderators who will take over the webinar. Caroline Manildi is a member of the task force and is an officer of the Borrego Valley Endowment Fund. And Betsy Kanak is also a member of the task force and you probably know her better as executive director of ABNA. So Betsy's now going to introduce our panelist. Uh, Betsy, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, thank you for that nice introduction. And I also like to thank you, Bruce, for your leadership of the task force. Oh, well, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, friends and neighbors. Uh, thank you for attending our Borrego Springs COVID-19 task force town hall today on the topic of resilience. My name is Betsy Kanak, and I'm a member of the task force as Bruce mentioned. And along with me uh, today is my partner in planning this program, Caroline Manildi. But I have the pleasure of introducing our three esteemed panelists. Each of our panelists with their experience and successful leadership in their fields has much to offer us and our Borrego Springs community on the topic of resilience and our ability to remain safe and healthy and united through these trying times. I will introduce our panelists in the order in which they'll be speaking. First speaking will be Dr. Chuck Matthews. Chuck has a PhD in public health, a Master of Business Administration and a Master of Science in Public Health. Chuck is the Director of the North County Region's Health and Human Services for San Diego County. In addition, Chuck is an adjunct professor in the Graduate School of Public Health at San Diego State University and Cal State San Marcos. Next speaking will be Dr. Sherry Gandy. Sherry has a PhD in clinical psychology. She is a licensed clinical psychologist with the Borrego Health Behavioral Health Department. Sherry works at Borrego Health, providing mental health services 
for children, adolescents, and adults. And our third speaker today will be Colonel Gary S. Johnston. Gary is San Diego County's Chief Resilience Officer, a role within the county's Office of Emergency Services. In addition to that role, he is the county's COVID-19 reopening lead. Gary is retired at the rank of Colonel from a distinguished 30-year career in the U.S. Marine Corps. On behalf of Borrego Springs and the task force, we are very happy to have each of you here today. We welcome you and we thank you for being here. And now I'd like to turn the program over to our first speaker, Chuck Matthews. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Betsy. I really appreciate that introduction. And I just want to say um, thank you to, to Bruce, Caroline also, and the, and the entire task force for putting this on. It's so important for us to come together and, and talk about these things. Um, thanks so much for your leadership. Um, I, I just wanted to spend a few minutes and talk a little bit about resiliency, maybe do a little table setting um, for my colleagues uh, that I'm, I'm very fortunate to be uh, on this panel with. Um, but just to start, just basics, just even a resiliency definition. There's uh, actually Gary and I were just talking and he said there's, there's so many definitions of that, but just to, just to pull a couple, um, uh, when you talk about resiliency as far as an individual, that really is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, right? A psychologist might say it's the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, threats, family relationship problems, and those health problems, which of course could be exacerbated by something like a pandemic, right, or a fire or disaster. Um, community resilience uh, overlaps quite a bit. It's the sustainability of communities, whole communities to withstand and adapt to and recover from adversity and things that are happening to us right now. Um, for me in, in public health, I spent a lot of time um, working on resiliency from that community level. So I just wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about community resiliency and what that means for us and, and what's happening, I think, in our communities. Um, Community resilience really does equal community health as far as I'm concerned. Um, just like an individual, an individual can be more resilient, you know, the more healthy they are, right? Um, physical health, having adequate food, um, having uh, resources, money, those things, those help people be resilient. Well, that's the same thing for a community. A community that's economically sound um, has those, those things that make it healthy um, helps those, that community be more resilient when faced with those kinds of difficulties. So uh, a public health approach, which overlaps with a lot, whether you hear um, uh, Dr. Gandhi and, and uh, Gary talk about this, um, for public health, it really has to do a lot with collaboration, encouraging and establishing community engagement, which is really key. You know, while that's broad, uh, a couple of items that we focus on when we're talking about community engagement and collaboration is social connectedness and, and resource exchange and sharing. So people helping each other with resources, those types of things, and really having those connections, which all really lead to developing or creating a, a culture of community, you know, those relationships. Um, and, and that really forms the basis of building that culture of resiliency. So there's a lot of, lot of things that go into that, a lot of variables, and I'm sure our, our, my colleagues are gonna be talking about those, um, but that's really what we're starting to look at. So building that culture of community really starts with the community groups, committees, community organizations of all shapes and sizes that really, in a sense, care for and develop communities. Um, as I said, it's, it's helped by a strong economy, business climate, robust education systems, other infrastructure, that all goes into uh, creating a healthy community. Um, from what I've seen, I'll be honest, in, in, in my job uh, working in North County, which I get to work with a lot of uh, uh, communities, um, Borrego Spring is really rich um, and has a lot of robust, highly effective, engaged groups, committees, and organizations. You guys do. Frankly, um, there is a tremendous culture of community engagement there. Um, it really starts with the individuals. Let's really back up. It starts with the people that drive that in Borrego Springs or in any community. There are those community leaders, those folks that um, have an expertise or a passion um, that want to uh, donate and contribute that time and energy um, to build those communities. Um, and 
the communities we're talking about, you guys know these organizations I'm talking about, whether it's the task force that actually is putting this on today, um, there's health collaboratives, um, folks that uh, are involved with the, the, the clinic that's there locally that might engage health and human services on a regular basis, the school district there, collaborating with foundations, other organizations, business groups that are there. Um, these are all contributing to the health of that community and making sure that that community is, is healthy, thriving, um, and is able to be resilient through these types of things. Um, I'll be honest, I, I think another um, thing that comes to mind for this, to be honest, is, is Supervisor Jim Desmond's revitalization group. He, he started that not too long ago. As soon as he was elected, he came in and, and started that and created a forum for folks to be able to come together. Um, and a lot of other committees sprung from that. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be honest, I think key, and this is in public health and throughout, um, government doesn't come in and say, hey, this is how you guys should be running things or doing things, right? If you notice, uh, Supervisor Desmond's uh, revitalization group is really run by the folks in the community. They decide what are the priorities in those areas and really uh, Supervisor Desmond has folks like myself or Gary or other people in the community or have um, uh, have eyes on different uh, resources to be able to help. How can we help? How can we help the community meet those goals? You know your community better than anybody. You know it a lot better than I do. Um, but of course, when you share things, well, this might be helpful. Bruce uh, has said many occasions, hey, Chuck, what about health and human services and nurses coming out to do vaccinations? Help with those, the library. There's a lot of infrastructure and things and collaboration that can happen to strengthen those communities. Um, I think the other thing um, which helps communities develop and build their resilience is, is really, like I said, what we're seeing in Borrego Springs. Um, and really what I would like to do as we're in the midst of COVID and everything else, and, and this is a time where people are coming together, whether it's now during disaster or pandemic, it's even at those times when that's not happening. I really, my challenge to folks is to, to keep this up, to engage. Um, the engagement is great already, but to continue to be inclusive and encouraging people in the community to stay involved. And that makes a huge difference um, for the folks in the community, but then people individually, um, it makes a big difference. Um, that's what I wanted to, to, to share today and kind of challenge everyone on the line to do is to stay involved, um, contribute that time and expertise and those strengths that you have um, for the community and keep up the great work, frankly. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Betsy. Thank you so much, Chuck. I really appreciate that. And um, with that, um, I'd like uh, to turn the uh, program over to Sherry. And, um, and thank you, Sherry. Yes, thank you. Um, I appreciate the introduction. I appreciate Borrego Springs, the task force and the community for inviting uh, myself and my colleagues to come in and share with you guys the information that we have and, and help answer some questions that you guys might have. We're very humbled to do so. Um, so I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. Uh, one of the areas that I'm going to focus speaking on is more of the individual resiliency, right? Resiliency is a buzzword um, that we throw around and um, as Gary mentioned, or Chuck mentioned, was kind of defining um, what resiliency is, right? And so um, well, I'll be speaking on kind of the individual side of resiliency, but how these all really relate. Um, one of the analogies I like to use to really look at resiliency is, is it's like an onion, right? It has different layers to it. And as we peel it back, we can look at all these various layers, you know, from the individual to then our county, and then to you know, our state and to our country and to the entire world, right? All of these different aspects in our life have um, resiliency. Um, and so I'm gonna speak, um, as I mentioned, on individual resiliency and how it relates to the community as well. So um, I work in mental health, so I wanna kind of speak a little bit about that as well, because I think that's a big factor of resiliency. So mental health is really our emotional, psychological, and our social well-being. Really, it, our mental health affects the way that we think, the way that we feel, the way that we interact with ourselves and with others. You know, there's a lot of different things that affect our mental health, some of which are biological. And so when I mentioned biological, that's really like our genetics, the way that we're designed, our hormones, even the chemistry of our brain. Um, these are biological things about us, right? But there's also environmental things. Um, 
that affect our mental health. And that's our physical surroundings, right? That's situations that we're in, stressors that are happening, things such as the pandemic. Um, and so our internal biological makeup and our environmental experiences work together to really influence the way we handle situations and stress, right? And so that's one of the questions that a lot of people ask is, well, why does one person handle the same situation in a different way than somebody else might, right? And that's the way that we're born, our personalities and our life experiences and what we may be going through is impacting those things. So it's very, very complicated and yet very simple in a, in a lot of different ways. And so um, some of these things I may talk in more simpler ways, but obviously I acknowledge are very, very complicated in nature as well too. Um, but this situation, you know, this outbreak of the coronavirus was really unexpected. It's an unexpected source of stress that we're all experiencing. It's affected all of us and it's changed so many things in our lives. You know, it's changed things in the lives of our loved ones, our communities, our country. And when we go through significant change, it's really normal to experience um, all kinds of emotions, including stress, anxiety, depression, and even grief. I think one of the really big emotions that many of us share right now and can relate to is grief. And grief is our emotional reaction when we've lost something. And right it, during this pandemic, many of us have experienced a lot of loss. We've lost possibly our jobs, um, possibly attending school the ways that we used to in person. We've lost um, just the way that things used to be. Uh, and maybe even some of us have lost a loved one, you know, from this situation. Um, and so we're all really experiencing kind of this level of grief in addition to other emotions we may be experiencing. And it's very normal. You're not alone in this. You know, I think it's something that a lot of people can attest to and may speak up. We may not be speaking openly about it with each other, um, but it's very, very common. And we see that in that a lot more people are asking for help and reaching out for mental health services, right? Um, and so obviously as we're going through these things, there's stuff that we can do to help us manage and cope during these kind of feelings. But one of the things, of course I say this is normal and this is expected and many of us are going through this together, but it may look really different for each one of us. Um, and so I just wanna point out just some signs that maybe you or someone, um, you know, maybe needing, you know, some support during this time. And so just some things to look out for is, you know, if you notice yourself feeling really down or lonely or just kind of hopeless about things, maybe even anxious or worried or finding yourself avoiding things that you normally wouldn't avoid. You may notice, you know, if you're excessively sleeping or eating or not enough, you know, um, if you're just feeling more edgy or irritable or just kind of notice your mood swings are off a bit and they're causing problems with loved ones. Um, you may also feel numb. You may feel like things don't matter, right? Um, or if you notice yourself feeling just kind of confused or forgetful, you know, these are all signs to look out for. Um, as well, too, um, some people may notice that they're drinking more, or smoking more, using drugs more than usual. And so these are all signs to let us know that, you know, something may be up, that, that, that maybe either ourselves or someone needs some help. Um, you may notice that it's kind of harder to do kind of daily type stuff, you know, and take care of yourself. But these are signs to look out for, right? And so um, obviously we're all reacting in different ways, but these are common experiences that people are having, not just now. I mean, it's been around, mental health is something that's there, but these kind of situations can, can exacerbate it. It can make it come out more so, or new feelings that we haven't experienced before are now coming up. And so just, just some things to look out for and to know to ask for help. There's a lot of help out there to help people through these sort of um, emotions and experiences and um, any mental health concerns. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, some people wonder like, why do some people handle situations differently? Well, something that there's been a lot of research around, which is this buzzword of resiliency, right? Resiliency is our ability to really adapt to these difficult situations, recover from them and bounce back even stronger. Right. And so resiliency, um, an analogy for that kind of experience is like climbing a mountain. It takes time. It takes strength. It takes help from others around you. You're likely to experience setbacks. Um, but eventually when you reach it or you get there, you look back and reflect on how far you've come. And so resiliency doesn't mean that you don't experience stress or you don't experience emotional tur turmoil. It's really resiliency. It's being able to work through the emotional pain and suffering. 
And so why is resiliency important is because it gives people skills and strengths to overcome hardships. It's not to avoid them, it's how to get through them. Um, and those who have done um, you know, studies around resiliency and looking at these different factors on how or why some people are able to kind of work through these um, in certain ways is those that are more resilient will tap into their strengths um, and their support systems to overcome these problems, right? And so some characteristics that we see that have already kind of been mentioned in the community setting is social support. You know, um, it's important to have a solid, positive support system that can include your family, friends, coworkers, community members, church members, you know, your Borrego Health Group. It, it, it's having a purpose. It's having a reason to, to be connected, a reason to um, get going and, and to do things. And really so resilient people seek and create meaning and purpose in their lives um, by engaging in activities and things that are aligned with what's most important to them and, and allows them to contribute to the greater good. And that's the idea of community, right? A lot of times we get more out of giving than we do receiving. Um, and so finding ways to kind of give and support each other kind of through this time. Uh, another, you know, factor of resili uh, resilient individuals is active problem solving. Um, it's expecting that change will happen, um, you know, and, and when it does, they accept what they can't control and put their efforts into the things that they can problem solve and the things that they can advocate for. They maintain a positive outlook, right, even if they don't have all the answers, even if things are in a really difficult spot, um, they choose to believe that things will will work themselves out. And they tell themselves, you know, in these situations that things will be manageable, even when it doesn't feel like it. And so sometimes that's relying on the strength of our loved ones and professionals to help us maintain that perspective in really tough times. Um, the um, resilient individuals um, engage in self-care. You know, self-care is attending to our physical, our mental, our spiritual, our emotional needs. Um, it, it's really attending to these different aspects of ourselves intentionally um, to reduce stress and promote wellness, right? And so that can be daily physical activity, eating healthy, um, getting good sleep, taking time to rest and recoup and enjoy the activities we, we, we enjoy. And, and one of the things that's been a challenge during this COVID is some of the ways in which we typically do these things have changed. And so overnight, the way we would engage in self-care or, you know, reaching out to others, maybe spending time in person shifted and it was very sudden. And so there was a period where many of us felt isolated and alone or may even still feel that way. And so, yes, there are um, public health, you know, situations put into place to keep us physically healthy and safe. Um, yet there's still ways to get our social and self-care needs met it's about adapting them, right? And that's the resiliency piece. How do we adapt to these things that I used to do and do it in a different way and still stay socially connected through telephone or through Skype or through other means or, um, you know, with our, our small family knit community and what that looks like. How do we still attend church? You know, if it's live streamed or what, how that may be. Um, and so there's been a lot of uh, change in adaptation. The good news about resiliency is it's not something that you're either born with or not, but it's rather something that can be built over time. Um, so really a lot of this stuff is, can be learned, ways of adapting to life-changing situations and building resiliency. And so, you know, kind of going through these things and saying, okay, what are some of these areas that I'm already doing really well and great, continue? You know, what are some areas that maybe I can kind of work on? You know, what are some areas that maybe I can ask for help? And, and sometimes that is, you know, help can be through loved ones, it can be through our support networks, and sometimes it can be professional help. And um, there's a lot of resources out there to, to have like mental health services. And I'll share that with the group so that can be passed along um, in terms of you know, there's a disaster distress helpline, um, a national suicide prevention lifeline, there's mental health services in the community, and there, there's things that are, act, you know, we have access to 24-7 to help us through, you know, our emotional distress, you know, or crises that we may um, be experiencing. Um, so that's just a little bit on just kind of individual resiliency, the fact that we can build on those, there are coping skills that we can engage in, Yes, they may be adapted and changed, you know, during this time. And, and some of us have already been able to do that on our own. And some of us may need additional help or support and brainstorming what that could look like in our lives uh, today and moving forward. And, um, you know, and, and I'll invite questions 
um, as we move on as well too, but I'll go ahead and pass it on so we can talk more about uh, community resilience. Oh, Sherry, thank you so much. Uh, that was just great. And it gives us a lot to think about, very hopeful. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to turn uh, the uh, meeting over to uh, Gary Johnston and hear, uh, hear from Gary. Thank you, Betsy. And again, thanks for this invite. And I really, my hat's off to the task force for putting this together. Um, my wife and I are headed back to Borrego. We live in Ramona. We love Borrego. We're coming back for our 30th anniversary. That's pretty telling that we want to spend our 30th anniversary in Borrego Springs. So the only thing I ask is cool it down before we get there. Um, <laughs> with, with that, let me go ahead and just the fires really. I'm going to try to go through my notes here very quickly because I really want to leave a lot of time for, for your questions. And I, hopefully there's going to be a lot of them out there. Uh, I recently retired a couple years ago from the Marine Corps out of here at Camp Pendleton. I got asked to come down here and, and take on this position called the Chief Resilience Officer. And, and you're right, resilience is kind of a buzzword. It's still a pretty popular word, but it has a lot of meanings to a lot of different people. I would tell you that if you go back and look at the Rockefeller Foundation, they, they spent a lot of money and established what was called the 100resilientcities.org. And what that was is they basically funded a lot of money and provided a lot of manpower to cities internationally. And all those cities had to compete. They had to compete uh, to uh, and basically fill out an application on why they deserve to get the funding from Rockefeller. And part of that funding was that they would be uh, funded for a chief resilience officer for that city for a period of two years and some staffing that would allow them to build a, a strategic plan for that entire city to, to weather, you know, to become more resilient. Um, well, that, that, that filled up pretty quick. They started in 2016 and by 18, it was already filled out. You actually had 101 because Houston, Texas got in very late with after Harvey uh, and the Gulf Corporation kind of helped split the bill uh, and they got one, uh, one chief resilience officer as a result of that. But you have resilience officers that, that span the planet. Uh, you've got them in Jakarta, you've got them in Israel, Rome, uh, uh, Paris, uh, London. You've got them in New Orleans, Pittsburgh, New York. You've got them in LA, San Francisco. Uh, and so typical, in typical fashion, this county showed great initiative and started thinking, well, you know, maybe we could use a resilience officer at our level, somebody that could put together some kind of a strategy for us so that we would have kind of a whole of community approach to achieving greater community resilience in the face of the physical, social, and economic uh, challenges that we face now in the 21st century. Uh, so enter Gary Johnston. Now, I, I'm not a guy to basically build you, uh, you know, a, 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 a thousand page strategy like most you'll see in the cities that sit on coffee tables. Uh, what, I, what I actually developed with my team was what we call a resilience program. And I actually sent a copy of that program. Uh, it looks a little bit like this. I'll show this to you. I sent a copy of this to our task force so they have it. If they want to forward that to you, it's open to the public. Uh, we actually finished this thing up in February, but then we got hit with COVID. So it, it has, I've been kind of delaying the dissemination of it. Um, but what this particular program was designed to do is, is exactly that. Uh, it's kind of like an inspector general. I go around and with my team, we take a look at all the potential acute shocks and chronic stressors. Uh, and I'll define those in a minute. Uh, the other thing that it does is it does define resilience for the county. Uh, I looked up and uh, with the Homeland Security thinking I would find the one definition by the military or by this particular agency that would define it. Well, when I started researching even that agency alone, I found out there was over 70 different definitions for resiliency, even through one agency. Uh, so my team got together, we looked at all of them, uh, you know, and we basically came up with that resilience is the ability to resist, recover uh, from or adapt to the effects of what we call acute shocks or chronic stressors. And then we got to learn to live with the changes in uncertainty. Now acute shock, what is that? What is that? Acute shock is, is the wildfire. The acute shock is the earthquake. The acute shock is a pandemic. Uh, but we also know there's some chronic stressors out there that we really need to take a hard look at as a county. Things like homelessness, things like uh, 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 substance abuse disorders, poverty. Those are basically type things that basically will impact you over an extended period of time where the acute shock usually comes and goes. We're kind of in a hybrid right now with COVID, quite frankly, because it's a combination of acute shock 
but it's also quite frankly a, a massive chronic stressor and will be probably through uh, 2024, 25 until we hopefully can really economically and socially recover from this thing. And so that's really our definition, um, why it matters. It matters because at the individual level that was discussed, um, when you're resilient, uh, you can face challenges uh, and you can thrive uh, in the face of challenges. And then when you're an organization, uh, you basically have that staunchness about you that, that if you're truly resilient, sometimes it doesn't affect you at all. And that's really the ultimate uh, test when you're resilient is that when it is a hot day, uh, it doesn't feel so hot to you. Um, so that's kind of it as far as the program. I will tell you the program is built down into three components. The one component that I think is worth mentioning to you is what I call the uh, resilience review process. It's a five-step process. And what we do with that is we look at all the potential shocks and stressors that are going to face this county or the community. And we go through a five-step that says, let's pick the one that we believe is the most, uh, the most uh, egregious or the most threatening. And so when I first got here in Strata putting this program together, they asked me, hey, Gary, we want you to start doing a resilience review on wildfires right now. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I haven't even developed the program. But yes, sir, I'll do that. And that's actually what we did uh, while we were building the program. We did a deep dive with a, a team of subject matter experts from in the county, outside the county. And we looked at all the potential resilience gaps, those things that we know we could improve upon to make us more resilient to wildfires. And we looked at things left of fire, as in pre-fire. We looked at things for our ability to respond to the fires and then how we would recover from the fires. And from that, we developed 50 tasks. And those 50 tasks, things that we had to do, we assigned those to different departments within this county. And I put an expiration date on when they're supposed to get those things done. And I will just be happy to tell you, it was one year ago where we did this report. I will be briefing out the Board of Supervisors on the 29th of this September. So tune in to a Board of Supervisors where we basically review what we've done in the last year. We've accomplished 66% of those tasks. And I will tell you, just based on how we performed at the Valley Fire, and I was out there for three straight days as an OES rep, uh, I will tell you some of the things that we did in this report paid huge dividends on how we were able to contain that fire. And so that's the big resilience review process. And you can use this type of process in anything. I'm actually potentially going to be looking at homelessness. If we ever get ourselves out of COVID, that may be the next threat that, uh, that my team takes a look at and figure out what can we do to be more resilient to that. That is a wicked complex problem, as you can figure. Uh, I'm going to kind of stop right there uh, and maybe finish up with uh, what I consider four four factors that I think can help build your resiliency. Uh, the first one is information and communication. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, I can become very, very resilient just by the method of which I receive information. What kind of information am I receiving? Uh, how is the communication? You all are doing dynamite. Just this particular venue right now, as Chuck said, is a form of information sharing or communication. Uh, those, type of, uh, uh, those type of settings that you have or these venues actually will make you more resilient because information is often power. Uh, it allows you to be prepared. But that is the second uh, building block or the second factor is preparedness. Um, the in to, from the individual to the organization to the community. It's not just one person being ready, having your kit, your survival kit. It's the whole community. Uh, and so you really need to take a look at how do I become better prepared? Training, uh, resourcing, there's a lot of hard calls that have to be made if you want to invest money uh, to be resilient for that flood that's coming or that heat wave that's coming. But that resourcing may obviously save a lot of lives and actually make things cheaper in the long run. If you don't invest a few million dollars in firefighting, uh, you'll spend uh, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, dealing with the aftermath. Number three is mitigation. You know, you know, that's basically examples like defensible space, absolutely going out and doing those things that will basically uh, facilitate you uh, being able to better respond to a wildfire or a, a specific hazard. Defensible space, your ingress, egress, evacuation routes, even budgeting really is some means to, to, to mitigate. And then finally, uh, as far as the protective factors, that's response and recovery capabilities, response and recovery capabilities. 
from our operating uh, area, emergency operations center, that entity and the way it's designed and the way it supports multi-jurisdictional response to your firefighters and your fire trucks, all the way to your hospital system, your behavioral health uh, um, capacity, all those type of things also require, uh, you know, are factors that have to be considered to be more resilient. I'm gonna take a breath there and turn it back over to Betsy and let's get into some, uh, some tough questions. Betsy? Oh, that was great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, all right. And I'd like to thank all three of our speakers. It's just excellent, helpful, uh, insightful information. And with that, I do see that uh, I have Carolyn on board uh, to, with some prepared questions, as well as I know Bruce is monitoring the Q&A, and I do see uh, several questions have come in from our attendees. So, uh, Caroline, would you like to, to start with the questions? Yes, thank you, Betsy, very much. And thank you to all our speakers for excellent comments this morning, uh, this afternoon. Uh, I am going to address questions in the order of the speakers. So the first question I have will be for Chuck. Chuck, you're on the, on the hook here for, um, as you said, resilience is a response to rising levels of insecurity and vulnerability and involves our individual and collective ability to respond and recover from these adverse conditions. So I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Given the overwhelming amount of COVID-19 information, sometimes often incorrect or contradictory, are there just a few reliable and credible sources of information about COVID-19 that you would recommend? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I'll be honest, I, I go to some uh, official sources and of course I'm biased, but I, I go to the, the government um, as far as the local government. So um, as Gary explained our program, you can sign up for alerts, uh, whatever the disaster is, but, but for COVID, we spent a lot of time um, uh, ensuring information is available, what's happening locally. Because we can hear about what's, what's happening nationally and statewide, but I mean, to be honest, locally is, is where it's at for us. That's where the rubber meets the road. Um, and at the San Diego County um, website, uh, covid.org. Uh, dash 19. Dash 19, sorry, dot org. Um, literally via sector. So if you're in the business sector, if you're part of schools, um, faith-based, there are actual specific um, web pages and information there um, for folks uh, as far as how the COVID, how COVID is affecting those arenas. We also have uh, what we call sector calls. So we have calls every week with all these different sectors talking about what's the latest information, how can we share information, how can a restaurant uh, be up and running with new restrictions, any business. So we have that all going, and I, so I, locally, I would definitely go to the, the county for that. Okay, thank you, Chuck. You can follow that up and do it, the state does the same thing, but again, I'd stick with the local information. Okay, thank you. As you know, uh, Borrego developed this COVID-19 task force over six months ago, right at the beginning, probably, of the pandemic. Given what Borrego has done, do you think that Borrego Springs would be a good community to be a test site for any potential upcoming COVID-19 strategies? And what might those be? You know, I'll be honest, as I shared, I think a little bit before, when we first even had contact with uh, community leaders in, in Borrego, we were just really kind of impressed and, and blown away as the county was setting up these um, uh, sector calls and, and outreach to certain communities. Borrego was already doing that. They weren't waiting for anybody to, to do that. You guys started building that, you know, six months ago, which again is amazing. And, and I think even at the time I, uh, I said to Dr. Sayon, you know, actually that should be held up as a model for other folks, to be honest. So in a sense, you guys are leading the way. Um, and I think just even based on that, yeah, depending on what comes down the pike as far as strategy, especially in the community, I, I think Borrego is a candidate for that. I think by putting heads together, leaders there in Borrego, and then uh, county or state officials, we'll have to see what those might be. Well, that's good news for us. Thank you. I have another question. Um, do you feel that as a result of this pandemic, the rural communities are receiving enough focus from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services? You know, I, I really do. I think um, a big focus when we, when we hear from our federal partners and our state partners, 
you know, the, the big issue, we already know this and, and are aware of this, but they want to ensure that we are reaching all communities. And I'll, you guys know this, the, the County of San Diego is probably one of the my di most diverse uh, counties, you know, in, in the nation, you know, whether it's rural, mountain areas, the beaches, we have dense. Um, so we've really created our service approach to a regional community model so that we're able to kind of tailor those services um, to the community. As I mentioned, Supervisor Desmond's uh, revitalization group, it is about bringing the, the staff, the departments out to the community to say, what do you guys need? How can we help you reach the goals that you want? And so that's the framework, as I think Gary has said, that we've used in our approach to uh, disaster. Well, thank you very much, Chuck. I'm going to move on. There may be more questions for you coming up from the audience, okay? Not so I'll turn to Sherry now. I recently read that the Kaiser Foundation released a poll showing for the first time that a majority of American adults, over 53%, believe the pandemic is taking a toll on their mental health, which of course affects personal resiliency and community resiliency. This is not good news. Now I know you spoke a great deal about mental health, health issues uh, affecting people today. What are some of the ramifications of those um, with respect to issues concerning child abuse and other kinds of things that we are hearing are rising in, in quite you know, substantial numbers? Yeah, and so, so mental health has um, always been around. Uh, there's been stigma around it. It hasn't necessarily been talked about as well. And so one of the great things is we're starting to see people open up more and speak to their experiences with mental health. And so we are like naturally in the past few years seeing more people open up and, and we're seeing the rise in those numbers as a result of decreasing stigma around it. Then on top of that, when we experience a significant event such as the pandemic, it does then kind of also add a chronic layer of stress for people, especially as I mentioned, if we are losing things and things of that nature. Um, and so, yeah, that, that is concerning, you know, and yet at the same time, there are things that we can do to help manage our mental health, right? So, so we all as human beings experience a range of emotions. We experience sadness, we experience depression, we experience stress, we experience anxiety. These are normal things, but sometimes when it becomes a little too much, and it starts affecting our day-to-day -day functioning or the way that we're able to interact, that's where we also want to be able to get help. Um, and so one of the ramifications is we know with chronic stress, it affects the way that we feel physically and mentally. Um, and so it's important to notice and know your warning signs, know if you're experiencing any changes and things of that nature and, and open up, talk to a loved one, you know, talk to somebody and, and ask for help. Know that there is a lot of support out there. One of the responses to what you're, what you're mentioning is yes, we have seen a rise in mental health concerns. And so people have been, um, you know, legislation has loosened up some of the regulations around how we can provide mental health, which is how telehealth came about, where now we are um, able to serve, you know, individuals who maybe didn't have access to mental health care needs or couldn't afford transportation to get there. And so there is this opening up of um, access to care. And there's been, a, in a response to that, there's been, um, you know, hotlines that have been created to be able to receive 24-7 um, help from professionals. Um, I will share that information as well, too. Um, um, but those are definitely ways in which we can um, attend to our mental health. Thank you. Are there differences, differences in resiliency between men and women? Hmm. Um, you know, I think that's one of those things that, you know, when we tend to gender norm men and women, you know, I think that's been one of those um, struggles in our field of that generally we're human beings, right? And based on our upbringing and our backgrounds, you know, there's different ways in which we respond. You know, I don't necessarily per se know that there is a difference between men or women. It's a lot more is more of our childhood experiences, our upbringings, um, and our current social support that more so influences the way that we respond to stress and work through it. Now, one thing that we do know is culturally, um, women, one of the studies that we do, or studies we do know is women tend to be more open to or accepting of sharing their feelings. And so it gets identified at times and then open to help. 
Um, sometimes for men, culturally, based on our upbringing, our culture, our environment, maybe those things, um, you know, aren't or stigmatized to talk about. And so it's carried a little bit more internally and maybe not identified or comes out in behavioral type um, situations. And so it, I don't think it necessarily defines resiliency, but it can serve sometimes if there are barriers like that to getting help, you know, and, and a big part of resiliency is getting help and support so we can work through things. Um, but I think more so it's more like our upbringing and our personalities than it is necessarily gender differences. Good. Well, thank you. What are some of the ramifications of spending so much time now in our lives on screen time, working from home, schools online, etc.? cetera? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of those questions would be like, what maybe are the ramifications physically and what are maybe the ramifications emotionally? I probably can't speak so much on the physical side of that in terms of like, that would be a really great question for someone who is an MD, but obviously we're talking about things of like, making sure that like we're not sitting for extended periods of time making sure that like you know it's not straining our eyes that we're taking breaks that we're stretching you know doing all of those things that are important uh, in terms of how it would affect our emotional well-being i think in the same way right making sure that we're not stagnant making sure that we're getting up and that we're walking that we're exercising that we're still engaging in other activities that release you know endorphins and release dopamine that help us with regulating our mood you know those are things that are very important when it comes to socialization i think it's allowed uh, fortunately for technology it's allowed for many of us to stay connected um, and i think it's been a very important thing um, to to use technology and use screen time to get our social needs met and in that sense as well too i think one of the things we've been focusing on with children a lot of screen time how much time we allow them um, to play on the computers and what they're doing. And I think it's less about the amount of time on the screen. It's what what is the content that they're using the screen for, right? And so if the content is for connecting and socializing, a lot of children use video games in that way. Of course, as a parent, you want to monitor and know what they're using. But if, if their intent is to connect and stay socialized, that's a great thing to reduce isolation. Um, and so it can be a very good thing. And I think, um, I think each family can be different in deciding what that time frame feels is appropriate. Um, but I think, I think right now, especially one of my suggestions to parents is to maybe be a little bit more flexible on how we viewed screen time. Um, just look, look at the underlying factor on why these kids are being drawn to it and help them meet those needs. Thank you for that. Given that there are probably many grandparents uh, listening to this webinar, how can we help our grandchildren during this time of COVID? Mm -hmm. Very great question. Uh, COVID's affecting, uh, affecting everybody's emotional and uh, well-being in different ways, right? And, and children aren't exempt from that. Children are feeling it both directly themselves. You know, things have changed in their lives. Maybe their parents' level of stress has changed around them as well, too. So they're very, very aware. But developmentally, we all make sense of it a little bit differently. And for children, they don't always have the words or the language to express how they're feeling. And so as grandparents, as loved ones, as parents, as whoever is involved in caretaking for these little kiddos, it's really allowing them some space to ask them how they're feeling, ask them what's changed for them. If they don't have the words to maybe even describing it to them saying hey you know we've gone through a lot of changes and sometimes other children feel worried or they feel scared have you felt that way letting them know that that's very normal and that they can talk about it and they can talk to their grandparents their parents or or, love, or a safe adult you know about what they're going through and so i think as a grandparent we can definitely create that safe environment and sometimes it's really nice because you're separated from the parent who's maybe more of the the one that's disciplining and helping them like you know with the schoolwork and stuff and so it creates a really really unique and special relationship to be able to open up and talk about maybe some of the feelings or things they're experiencing and i think that's one really incredible way to be able to help those kiddos right now well that's excellent advice i thank you very much and I thank you for all your uh, points today. And I'm going to move on now to uh, ask some questions of Gary. Um, my first question to you, Gary, is if you were comparing various communities within San Diego County with respect to resilience, how would you rank Borrego Springs? Oh, I just told you I was coming out to Borrego. And if I said anything else and you guys are in the, you know, the number one, I'd probably, uh, I'd probably never, make it out of Borrego after I came to visit you guys. <laughs> I, you know, honestly, I think that you've got to be in, in the uh, in, in the very top tier of, of readiness. I mean, 
I've been around here. Uh, obviously, I've been in and out of Camp Pendleton, but I've now retired and been living in, in uh, Ramona for a little bit over a year. Uh, but I do spend most of my time, you know, down in the Kearney Mesa area, and I've been been involved in a lot of the communities. And these type of venues you're doing, um, I, there are not many of them going around. And so right now, I would just tell you when it talks to those factors we talked about. Uh, communication and outreach. Uh, that, this is one of the best venues that I've seen. So I think you guys are doing incredibly well on that. Um, and then I, I've been through the town. I mean, I've just been through town and, and uh, you know, I think there's a lot of things done out there um, that uh, I think I, I haven't been able to be in, involved to the level that I can take a look at the budget and see how the budget is being spent in regards to, uh, to resiliency. Um, but my sense is, is that uh, you've got a very disciplined uh, uh, community. Uh, and for me, as a military guy, that's, that's where I'm all about, because the more disciplined the community, the better it communicates, the better it takes care of its own, the more resilient it's going to be. Well, thank you for that. So now I have another question re re uh, revolving around the Borrego Springs economy. As you know, we rely heavily upon seasonal tourists and seasonal residents and our tourists. Do you think that we can convince such visitors to practice COVID safe behaviors when in our town? And what are the most important actions that the community of Borrego should take to try to make that happen? I, th I think you absolutely can. Matter of fact, the way I would look at it is uh, it's an opportunity. Uh, and people can feel like they can come to Borrego Springs. And because of what we just talked about, the fact that uh, you are going to adhere to the appropriate protocols to make Borrego safe for not only for the community, but for those of us like my wife and I to come and enjoy it and feel like we're safe when we come there. And so I think that, uh, so some people look at it like, hey, that's gonna, do, uh, you know, that's, gonna, that's gonna prevent tourism from coming. I would say exact opposite. I think the way you play it, the way you promote it, is this is why you want to come to Borrego because it is a safe place to be that we take this very very seriously that we understand that the balancing public health and safety with socioeconomic re reopening is extremely challenging but Borrego Springs does it the best and so specific things that I think that you always have to be concerned with or communicate that's easy for people to remember is the big four the big four is the fact that we screen uh, we screen our employees, our volunteers, and when we can, uh, we'll, we'll screen patrons, uh, you know, depending on what the setting and the venue is. Number two is uh, we have incredibly uh, stringent hygiene and sanitation protocols. Whether you're going to go to one of our restaurants, you're going to go to our, uh, you know, hike our trails or go to our visitor center, uh, you're going to have those very stringent hygiene and uh, sanitation protocols. Third is face coverings. Uh, it's mandatory in the state, it's mandatory in the county, so guess what? It's mandatory here. And I think that your employers have to basically dig their heels in and say, hey, no face coverings, no dice. And there's obviously areas where some folks can't wear face coverings for a certain reason. We could, I can answer questions on how you deal with that, uh, but quite frankly, uh, everybody needs to do their part, the individual, the business, and the community. And then number four is that physical distancing, six feet. Uh, and so through signage and through uh, barriers or partitions and things of that nature, uh, if you can do all four of those things, the combined effects of doing all four of those things at any and all of your venues makes you safe, makes me safe when I come to visit. Does that answer the question? That answers the question very well. Thank you so much. And I'm going to close That's off it. the questions because time is running short and I thank you all for your response. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I, uh, Thanks, Caroline, very much. Um, a few questions have come in from our attendees. So I was hoping to ask those too. We still have a few minutes left here. And I think we can get through them. Now the font I'm seeing is very small. So please bear with me if I stumble over words. Uh, one uh, is for Gary, but it's something that he asked us to do. And that was, um, we were asked if we could, uh, if the attendees could receive the resiliency framework document. And so, yes, the task force will send that out to um, all of you um, attendees. Uh, so that was one uh, question. Now I have, uh, let me panel through. So here's another kind of long question for Gary. So I'll read it. Uh, Gary, first, thank you for your service. Would you recommend that our community further develop an inventory of resources, knowledge, and talent of individuals 
not 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 organizations especially more individuals we can prepare organize and align to deal with emer emergency responses you know who are our assets how do we organize them set up communication systems etc whoever sent that question sounds like a, a military man or woman quite frankly but absolutely <laughs> Um, you know, when I was going into uh, places like Iraq or Afghanistan, the one thing that I always knew about my unit is I knew every Marine that had a special skill. I knew a kid that could hotwire a car. I knew a kid, guy that was the best generator mechanic in the planet. I knew a guy who could do anything with wires or communications. And so, yes, absolutely. Uh, resources, those resources that you believe you will need. I think you need to definitely have a stockpile. I, I think the, the thing that you have to think about is that what's the most likely, uh, you know, hazard that we're going to face? Um, or do you want to basically invest in what's the most dangerous? I could argue that the most dangerous for this county or this uh, in San Diego is an earthquake. But when you look at the level of probability of that compared to a wildfire, you know, and you're, and you're in Borrego Springs, Earthquakes might not be where I make all my investments. There'll be a lot of similarities in how we deal with responding or preparing and responding for both. But I would say first take a look at what's the most likely hazard that we're going to face at Borrego. Pandemic, uh, flood, fire, and then maybe base most of your, your, your efforts and your resources in that regard. But get your resources gathered. Uh, find out who's got the tractors, the trailers, the big trucks, who's got the skill sets that you may need. Uh, and then basically what I call battle rostering. Get it all on the roster so you know when you can call somebody, how to get a hold of them, multiple means of reaching somebody. And obviously uh, an agreement that when we call that individual or those individuals will come and, and support the response. I'll leave it at that, but uh, you know, and by the way, I can give you another 15 minutes if you'd like. So if we want to go into a lightning round with questions, I'm happy to stay on for 15. I don't know about my other uh, my teammates, but I'm willing to stick it around for a little while. Back over to you, Bruce. Okay, well, I'll keep asking questions and we'll see if, <laughs> if, if people hang in with us. Uh, we still haven't reached the hour mark yet. And Gary, I'll ask you this question. I don't know if you can answer it because it's not you know, directly your area of responsibility, but one attendee asked, um, will, the, will the park, meaning the Anza Borrego State Park, uh, reopen by January? I don't, I don't know that question. Again, for a while, the parks uh, had, had come open. I'll look into that for you uh, and see where we're at. I know that this, uh, I know that we shut down all of our national, national forests uh, and some of our state parks because of the fires. Um, I would hope that those will actually reopen pretty soon. There's been some weather changes up north, definitely in the Colorados. Uh, uh, they got some really frigid cold weather. And although that's not in California, what that did is it, it released a lot of resources that can go elsewhere and maybe come help us out and speed up the, the recovery and the containment of these fires up north. I don't have a good answer to that to you now. I'll look into it. And if I get some good information updates, Bruce, I'll send it your way. Okay. Uh, here's another one, Gary, um, more in your, your wheelhouse. Um, and you, I think you uh, partially or uh, substantially addressed this during your talk, but if there's anything else that occurs to you, the question is, what lessons from San Diego's resilience work on wildfire can we apply to COVID? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, I think, uh, I think there's probably a, a lot. Uh, you know, when you look at what we did and the methodology that we used to determine what needed to be done, the first thing I would tell you is that I wasn't the expert on fires. You know, I can lead people and plan and help people plan and, and develop this report and determine the objectives. I can task track, I can track all the tasks, um, but I needed subject matter experts and we needed folks from more than just internal to the county or maybe just internal to Borrego Springs. I needed uh, conservationists, I need fire scientists, I need firefighters, I needed folks that were part of the uh, community uh, fire safe councils. I needed people that were actually living it and lived through fires and survived fires. And so I think when you look at how you respond to what's going on with COVID, that the methodology and the approach that we use to basically analyze this threat uh, absolutely feeds into where are the resilience gaps as a result of that. And, you know, I didn't have all the answers, but I tell you what, folks said, we need more of this, we need more of this, we need less of that. That's what generated all of our tasks. And then when we assign those out to the to subject matter expert that could accomplish it, 
and you put a timeline on it, we also captured how much we thought it would cost. And most of the costs that we had in the report, actually, we were able to find grant funding for, so we didn't have to necessarily dip into the general fund through the county to get it paid for. So I think the approach absolutely applies. When you look at this document that we produced, the first, it's only 19 pages, but then what's in the back, in the back is a template of how you can do a resilience review and a report. Uh, I built this so that we could actually ha hand it off to other jurisdictions. I don't have any staff, but I tell you what, you know, I can pull people from the county that helps me do this, but the template that I've given, Borrego Springs could take a look at this document and you could absolutely probably apply it to what we were just talking about on how you might want to basically take a look at what you need to do to fill gaps in response to what you think is your most significant threat. Great, thanks. One last question for you, Gary, and then I've got a couple more for uh, Chuck and, and Sherry. Uh, this question is, um, one of the points of resilience of, in the resiliency program is to improve social services in the unincorporated areas. One thing we've started addressing is a medical transportation service especially for those who don't have a car or much disposable income. That program is likely to expand greatly and will need support. Is that something your office or the county can help with? Uh, that, I, I'm not probably the best expert on that. I will just tell you that it's not something that, you know, offline, Bruce, if you put that to me in writing, send that question to me, uh, I can probably find the right agency. Bottom line is you can never lose anything you don't have. And I would say that th through uh, your community leadership, yes, elevate that, elevate that. And we can see absolutely if it can be addressed. One thing I've been very, very impressed with, with this county, and I've only been here a little less than two years, uh, is the level of leadership. And absolutely, they believe in their motto, which is, you know, all for the public good. So push me that information, I'll dig into it, and we'll see if we can get you a reasonable answer. I, I just don't want to step in it because I'm not the expert in that regard. So thanks. Okay, we will we'll get back to you on that. So thank you very much, Gary. Um, question for Sherry. Uh, are coping skills culturally specific? Uh, for example, Borrego Springs large Latinx community could use uh, support uh, our support on coping skills, uh, or I'm sorry, I misstated it. Could our community uh, use coping skills that are culturally appropriate and responsive? Yeah, I think coping skills can go across the board, um, but I think different cultures may value different coping skills. And so one of the things that sometimes we see is like in some cultures, you know, it's more of an independent type culture. And so we talk a lot about individual resiliency and things of that nature, right? And in some other cultures, really the value is around collectivism. It's around the group and supporting in one another. And one of the things I've really you know, I work for Borrego Health, which, you know, we have multiple sites and one of the populations I serve is Borrego community. And one of the things I've really observed about the community is there is a strong value to connection and supporting one another, right? And it's come up in this form. And so I think one of really the strong utilizations of the coping skills of this culture is connection to one another, right? And, and that reduces isolation, it reduces connection. I think regardless of culture, um, our human instinct and desire, whether we know how to do it or other factors get in the way or past trauma or whatever may influence that, one of our deepest desires is to be connected. And that depends on what we define as connected to, right? Maybe a higher good, maybe our community, maybe our loved one, maybe, you know, our faith, maybe nature. And so really, I think a lot of these coping skills can be utilized and adapted across cultures to find out ways in which it like applies, um, especially to that individual in that culture. And I think when we talk about culture, right, we can talk about race and ethnicity, but we can talk about our gender. We can talk about our socioeconomic status. We can talk about our culture around our sexuality. We can talk about culture in a lot of different factors. And so I think based on those experiences, coping skills can definitely be adapted to meet our own needs. Great, thank you. And I'll have a question for Chuck, but you know, one of the great things about this, having so many uh, talented attendees on is one of them has uh, provided a clarification for us about the state park, one of our state park managers, uh, to just remind us that the Anza Borrego Desert State Park is open 
Uh, I'm suspecting the earlier question I asked was more about when will the visitor center be open? And, and I don't think we know that yet, but I just wanted to point out that, um, <clears throat> that we did get a, a clarification on that, that, uh, that I should have, uh, should have realized. Now I'll just finish. Uh, we're running over here five minutes at this point. One question from a seasonal resident and I'll direct it to you, Chuck. Um, as I uh, contemplate returning to Borrego Springs for my 15th winter session, I'm concerned that both visitors and locals are more or less in agreement that measures are in place and will be adhered to so that the spread of the virus during the coming winter months is kept to a bare minimum. This would seem to me to be a cornerstone of reducing stress, which might be caused by an influx of outsiders into a small, close-knit vulnerable community. So basically, uh, how important is that agreement on COVID safe behaviors, I think is the question. So how, how important that is. I, I think that's uh, very important. And, and um, as a community that has folks that are coming in and out on a regular basis, um, the, the folks that are there and the folks running those organizations that basically set the tone and set that example um, is key. Um, so I think it's very important so that no matter when you come in, whether it's, I think Gary and some folks had mentioned, whether it's signage, putting those things in place, almost putting yourself in their position. If I'm a visitor coming in, Gary's coming for his anniversary, he knows what to do, but say he didn't, um, you know, is there, is there signage? Is there, you know, direction there for people to, to know? Are the, when the first business that they walk in or the first gas station, you know, do they get that information? Um, so maybe you look at, you know, where are those first contact points for people when they come into the, the, to the community um, and ensure those are in place. But very important because it automatically sets the tone and says, hey, if you're going to be here, you're going to have a great time. But these are some things that, that need to happen so we all can have a great time and, and have less stress. Great. Thanks. And I'll just, uh, just mention something uh, since you brought this up. Um, the, with some advice from our business community, the task force has prepared a poster that we're about to distribute and we hope every storefront in town will put the same message in its front window. So as people, not, not just our residents who we hope will model good behavior, but as seasonal residents come from all over the country and tourists come, they see uh, we're all seeing the same message and hopefully you know living by the same COVID safe behavior. So that'll happen pretty soon. But I, I do want to thank you panelists so much for your informative and insightful uh, comments and the great responses you had to our questions. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough for that, for being so generous uh, with your time. I want to thank our moderators, uh, Betsy and Caroline, uh, for doing a great job. And I want to thank all of you attendees uh, for participate for you know being part of this. Uh, and we had uh, at one point uh, 60 uh, people online. People are just starting to drop off now, so we better end it. Uh, but we are planning to do uh, more town halls, and we will be announcing those and sending out invitations. So stay tuned for that. And uh, thank you all. Uh, I'm going to uh, end the. Uh, the webinar now. So take care. Bye-bye.